I'm just... We are live on YouTube. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, please let me know when I should share my screen. Yeah, I'll surely do that. Well, I'll just introduce you and then we will share that. Good evening everybody, welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. This is Pursue 15O which is Hematology Erythrocytic Disorder and we are streaming live from PGI Chandigarh via Kolkata. This is a continuation of our previous lecture which was session 1, Quantitative Disorder of Globin Chain. This is session 2 and to talk on that we have once again Dr. Prashant Sharma who is an MBBS MD DNB from Delhi University. DM in Hematopathology from Ames, New Delhi, DRC Path. Presently, he is an additional professor in the Hematology Department at PGIMR Chandigarh with research interest which includes disorders of RBC, erythropoiesis and laboratory instrumentation. He is also the associate editor of the Indian Journal of Hematology and Blood Transfusion since 2013. With about more than 150 papers on PubMed, Principal investigator in seven extra and intramural project worth 1.4 crore. He enjoys gardening, running, reading, traveling and trying out new cuisines. Today he is with his old cuisine which is talking about hematology. So before I ask sir to start, let me request all of you, please do not share your screen. Please keep your mic muted and your camera off. Without much delay, let me request Dr. Sharma sir, please share your screen and let us start. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. And please just give me a minute while I uh, figure this out. Yeah, just press that arrow there on your entire screen. Yeah, fair enough. Great. Let's make it full screen, please. Is, is, is it full screen now? Not yet. Please just give me a second. I think I...
perfect thank you please so, start sir thank you sir um, so good evening everyone and uh, thank you uh, dr nadeem for that kind introduction the uh, uh, so this is obviously the second part of the talk and uh, so we'll cut through the chase and uh, the part one of the quantitative disorders dealt with beta globin uh, uh, disorders chief uh, which is which by which we mean beta thalassemia so today we're going to be talking about alpha thalassemia and this talk is going to be in uh, three parts and uh, the first of course is going to be the introduction uh, we'll talk about gene structure nomenclature and the relevance of alpha thalassemia uh, to the indian pathological and clinical practice this question had come up last time as well and subsequently in a slight departure from the usual seminar style of teaching today we'll look at cases uh, uh, and that are illust uh, we'll look at multiple cases nearly six of them that illustrate different aspects of uh, how we suspect alpha thalassemia how we diagnose it in the lab and what is its role as a phenotype modifier so uh, going straight into the first part the alpha globin gene uh, uh, we actually have two of them as you can see in this figure and yes so uh, they are located right at the telomeric end of the short arm of chromosome 16 so this is actually depicting uh, the metaphase chromosome uh, 16 so they have doubled their material but on uh, each of us have four alpha globin genes two of which we inherited from our mother and two of which we inherited from our father the uh, the alpha globin genes are embedded just like the beta globin gene into what is called an alpha globin gene cluster and the reason why they are embedded uh, in uh, or a part of this cluster is because evolutionarily these genes have arisen as duplication events from one of the earlier existing genes and the other uh, reason why we need to know about the cluster is that embryologically as a fetus develops the order in which these alpha globin genes are expressed is the 5 prime to 3 prime uh, order of arrangement of these genes on the uh, uh, alpha globin uh, on the chromosome 16 and we can see within this there is the zeta chain then there are these three pseudo genes the uh, uh, we call them the psi zeta the psi alpha 2 and the psi uh, alpha 1 and then we have the actual uh, genes the alpha 2 and alpha 1 Uh, out of these the alpha 2 is the major producer it produces about 70% of the output of the alpha globin and alpha 1 is the relatively minor partner and then we have the theta gene so unlike beta thalassemia if you remember beta thalassemia from last time most of the um, genetic problems that can happen that lead to under production of uh, the mrna uh, or under uh, transcription of that gene were point mutations or small indels on the other hand for beta thalassemia the common uh, genetic event that inactivates the gene is the are large deletions and these can be really large deletions uh, so in this we've got the beta glo figure we've got the beta globin gene uh, sorry the alpha globin gene cluster and the parts in green highlight uh, the extent of the deletion that's happening so these deletions have been named after the areas within which they are most common and we can see in this southeast station um, deletion in virtually the entire cluster is gone in the filipino deletion not just the cluster uh, i mean the, the cluster is gone i think in the previous figure i i'll come to the hs40 later I, let's say and so similarly these are very large deletions on the other hand the ones that are shown at the lower end of this Uh, table are the ones which are common in india so we have relatively smaller deletions this is a minus alpha 3.7 kilo base pair deletion so this one is going to lop off a part of the alpha 2 and a part of the alpha 1 giving rise to a fusion gene an alpha 2 alpha 1 fusion and then we have the minus alpha 4.2 kilo base pair deletion which is going to uh, delete the alpha 2 globin gene which is of course the major producer so with that background uh, we can talk about how to name these genes so I, maybe i can introduce it in this figure itself if from a particular chromosome 16 one has virtually no production of any of any normal alpha globin chain then we going to call it an alpha not thalassemia or alpha zero 
thalassemia. So obviously in these five large deletions, both the genes are getting deleted. Perhaps a part of alpha-1 remains here, but that too doesn't produce anything. So these are alpha naught. On the other hand, in the two commoner, uh, in the two deletions that were common in India, we have, in the case of 4.2, the entire alpha one, and in the case of minus alpha 3.7 kb, the fusion alpha 2 alpha one. So these are alpha plus uh, uh, types of alpha thalassemia. So uh, on the on the other hand, when we have to call them uh, a patient's uh, genotype as being homozygous or heterozygous, we have to look at the entire chromosome 16. So if the two chromosome 16s in an individual are identical, we call that person as being homozygous for a particular genotype. On the other hand, if the two chromosome 16s do not match each other in terms of their genotype, then we will have to call that person as heterozygous. Alpha naught and alpha plus, so we have to look at the extent of globin chain production from a particular chromosome 16. If it's happening, then it's alpha plus, and if not, it's alpha naught. So let's try and put this into practice. This is how we write the genotype and every normal individual will have four uh, alpha globin chains and alpha 2 and alpha 1 on one chromosome 16 and an alpha 2 and alpha 1 on the other chromosome 16. So clearly this is the normal genotype. Now let's try this one. This person has deleted, uh, has lost to deletion one of his alpha globin genes. Okay, but he has three which are intact. So let us see, would we call it alpha naught or alpha plus? As far as the thalassemic allele is concerned, there is going to be some production from this allele. So we'll have to call it alpha plus. Do we call this person as homozygous or heterozygous? Well, the two chromosome 16s are not identical. So we'll have to call him or her heterozygous. So heterozygous alpha plus thalassemia is what this genotype is. Let's try this one. Both the uh, alpha genes on a particular chromosome 16 have been deleted. Maybe one of the larger deletions that we saw. The other one is normal. So, homozygous or heterozygous? Again, heterozygous. The two chromosome 16s don't match. Alpha naught or alpha plus? Alpha naught, because there is no output from the thalassemic chromosome 16. So, heterozygous alpha naught thalassemia. Okay, let's try this. Two alleles, uh, two of the alpha globin genes lost out of four, but it is one each on one each of the chromosome 16s. So homozygous or heterozygous? This one is homozygous. The two chromosome 16s are identical uh, or are similar in their genotypes. And is it alpha naught or alpha plus? Well, both of them are alpha plus. So this will become homozygous alpha plus thalassemia. This one is clearly heterozygous and uh, that this allele is alpha naught, so this becomes heterozygous alpha naught thalassemia. So at this point, just note that both the person with this genotype and the person with this genotype have only two out of the four functioning alpha alleles as normal, but alpha globin genes as normal, but the names are totally different. This is homozygous alpha plus thalassemia, and this is heterozygous alpha naught thalassemia. When three uh, of the four genes are lost, this person, this individual is going to be symptomatic and th this one gets a special name because of certain inclusions that they show, which is HDH disease. Excuse me. And if, uh, so HBH disease is three out of four uh, alpha globin genes that are lost. If all four are lost, then we have a situation that is incompatible with extra uterine life. Till the time the zeta chain was functioning, it was okay. But once the alpha is supposed to take over, and that happens very early during intrauterine life, then the baby is going to become hydropic, and we will have something called hemoglobin Barts hydrops fetalis. Okay, so, um, and then these are all large deletions. So uh, occasionally what can happen is a thalassemic point mutation or smaller uh, uh, indels can also happen, in which case we don't use this dash. We, we go back to the beta type of a system. We will just call it an alpha and we'll put a superscript T if there is a uh, less commoner thalassemic uh, mutation, which is not. I think I need to take care of this once and for all. So please just give me a second. Um, I do apologize but my phone seems to have hung. Hmm. 
right so this one is non deletional alpha thalassemia okay so classically we write this as alpha the, the first um, gene it becomes is alpha 2 and the second one is alpha 1 so in this case it's the alpha 1 allele, allele which is affected by the thalassemic mutation so we, this becomes non deletional alpha 1 thalassemia okay so before we uh, discuss uh, the genotypes and their resulting phenotypes there are some thumb rules about correlating them so the alpha 2 globin gene mutations are detected much more commonly than the alpha 1 gene mutations and this is because this should be obvious the alpha 1 gene mutations or deletions are better tolerated than the alpha 2 ones because the alpha 2 is the major producer in addition alpha 2 gene mutations have a more severe phenotype than alpha 2 gene deletions So now this is interesting. If you have a small uh, indel, uh, just one or two nucleotides which are replaced, that's going to be worse than if the entire alpha two gene is deleted. Okay, so even though it sounds counterintuitive, if the reason behind this uh, is that once the entire alpha two globin gene is deleted, the remaining alpha one gene on that chromosome gets upregulated. but this does not happen if the alpha 2 gene has simply a mutation but the rest of the gene is intact okay and this is because the transcription factors are shared between alpha 2 and alpha 1 so if the entire alpha 2 is gone then the alpha 1 gene gets some uh, gets upregulated because the uh, gene transcription has been stepped up and third is that in india we have a higher frequency of alpha plus genotypes so what this means is that there is a reduced frequency of symptomatic alpha thalassemia cases in our country so as we'll see very shortly the frequency of alpha thalassemia trait is actually higher than that of beta thalassemia trait but the frequency of symptomatic beta thalassemia is more uh, in number than symptomatic alpha thalassemia and that's because we are lucky to have the alpha plus genotypes so what are these alpha plus genotypes again in that nomenclature diagram every time you have a chromosome 16 that's going to have some output we'll call it alpha plus so this was heterozygous alpha plus thalassemia and this is homozygous alpha plus thalassemia and these are the two genotypes that are common in our country on the so when people with these genotypes are going to be marrying each other or or people with normal genotypes they're going to have children that are at worst going to be homozygous alpha plus thalassemia and if you have if you lose two out of the four alpha globin genes then you usually do not have any clinical issues on the other hand now think of a situation where this particular genotype is common which is heterozygous alpha not thalassemia so when persons like this are going to be marrying either normal individuals or people with alpha plus thalassemia then you will begin to get in uh, babies who have hbh disease or if they marry someone like themselves they are going to have uh, children at the risk of having children with hemoglobin bars so if this kind of a chromosome 16 is pre uh, prevalent in the population there uh, the situation is different and you going to have symptomatic alpha thalassemia subtypes and this is the situation that happens in southeast asian countries okay so i just told you that we have a lower frequency of alpha thalassemia the symptomatic types in india so why are we having a one hour class on this is it important at all to study it well yes for in, for example alpha thalassemia the trait and the silent carriers are actually commoner in incidence than beta thalassemia and last time we read that the frequency of beta thalassemia trait in uh, our country is about 3 to 5% and that of alpha thalassemia trait and silent carriers is higher it's 13 to 16% and yet we don't see so many hemoglobin bars and hbh disease are also relatively less common because most of the alpha traits are alpha plus clinically alpha thalassemia uh, can be relevant if it's a primary illness hbh disease but more often we see it as a phenotype modifier if you remember beta thalassemia the one of the major reasons um, uh, they, these patients with beta not beta not thalassemia become symptomatic is because they have excess alpha chains So, if a person with homozygous or compound heterozygous beta thalassemia co-inherits alpha thalassemia, their phenotype is actually going to get better. And the same thing applies for other hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell anemia. And then, alpha thalassemia 
because HPLC cannot pick up alpha thalassemia subtypes other than HPH disease uh, and hemoglobin parts, it can often get missed. And because it, the common screening technique is not going to be telling us about it, we may not be thinking about it. So. Uh, and then how do we diagnose it? We need to uh, diagnose it using molecular genetic testing in many instances and therefore there is a potential for even misdiagnosing it as will come up in one of our cases. So with that background and introduction, we are going to uh, get into our cases which are going to tell us various aspects of alpha thalassemia. So starting with case one, this was a 27 year old female. She's a primary gravida and uh, she has uh, she's at nine weeks of her pregnancy. And that's about the time when she was asked to undergo antenatal screening for beta thalassemia. And every time you do an antenatal screening for beta thalassemia by HPLC, you will also be looking at the complete blood count. So in this particular young woman's case, the hemoglobin was okay considering she's uh, pregnant or just a little low the, her rbc count on the other hand is elevated for a woman and especially for this hemoglobin she has microcytosis mcv is 71 and hypochromia mch is just about 20 and the mchc is actually kind of okay surprisingly even for her microcytosis and hypochromia her, RDD, her rdw is perfectly normal so what we're looking at are thalassemic red cell indices and this was confirmed on a blood film where the red cells were microcytic hypochromic but also perfectly uniform in size which means that we're probably not looking at iron deficiency as the cause of her mcv and mch being low so then her hplc was done and this is the hplc we can see that she has predominantly adult hemoglobin and her fetal hemoglobin and A2, uh, her fetal hemoglobin is within normal range and her A2 is actually slightly reduced. So she does not have beta thalassemia trait. So what are the causes of mildly reduced hemoglobin A2? The genetic causes include alpha thalassemia, uh, delta beta thalassemia and delta thalassemia. So the lesson, uh, and of course there are acquired causes which include iron deficiency, hypothyroidism and rare cases uh, of other uh, conditions. So remember if the HPLC is either normal or we have uh, an A2 which is uh, just slightly low, the lower limit is 2%, then the, uh, the cause for a per person's thalassemic red cell indices is likely to be alpha thalassemia. So if you have a thalassemic indices, but a beta thaltrate has been excluded on HPLC, and by the way, what are thalassemic indices? Normal or near normal hemoglobin with very uniform microcytosis and hypochromia and a relative or absolute erythrocytosis. The causes are beta thalassemia trait, of course, but also alpha thalassemia trait and less commonly silent carriers, by which I mean if one out of the four genes is gone. Trait means two are gone out of four. HBE trait and homozygous HBE state, persons with delta beta thalassemia trait, hemoglobin Lepore trait, persons who have iron deficient polycythemia vera, and persons who have iron deficiency but have been started on hematinix, they are all going to have red cell indices with, uh, uh, which are suggestive of a thalassemia trait, which means erythrocytosis, microcytosis, hypochromia, and a normal or near normal hemoglobin and a normal RDW. So, in this patient, the iron profile was normal. She was uh, presumed to carry an incidental alpha thalassemia trait. Why incidental? Because most likely this is an alpha plus thalassemia. The baby is not at risk and no further workup was required. The patient, however, happened to be a nurse and she insisted, you know, why don't you confirm alpha thalassemia? The only way to confirm it is using a PCR. And for this, we use a PCR reaction called GAP. PCR by which we mean that we are using primers that are going to be giving a product uh, only if the gap uh, has been cre uh, created uh, by the deletion. So we have primers which flank the deletion and uh, they will give a product only when the uh, deletion is present because under normal circumstances primers which are very far apart will not give you a product at all. So the other good part about this PCR is that you can uh, multiplex it, which means that we can, in a single PCR reaction, test for eight common alpha thalassemia deletions, which are minus alpha 3.7 and 4.2. The right word and left word will come up later in the class. The deletions of Southeast Asian, Mediterranean, South African, Thai and Filipino type 
because it is a very large 20 kilo basis, uh, kilo 20.5 kb dilution. So this is a PCR where you're going to get a product only if the uh, mutation is there. So the controls become very important in this PCR because you don't want to call the absence of a band as normal when actually your DNA didn't amplify. So this is the first control band, which is the list 2 uh, band. And this is just outside the um, alpha uh, gene cluster. And in addition, there is also a band for the normal alpha 2. And this is uh, the band that you'll get. Uh, so this particular individual in this lane would have been normal, as would have been this one and this one, because both the control bands are coming. If you're getting an additional band, well, then this is the position of the mi minus alpha 3.7 band. So because on one chromosome 16, we got this particular deletion 3.7, but the other alpha 2 gene is completely intact. So we know that this patient is heterozygous for alpha 3.7 deletion. In our patient, we are getting this 3.7 band. The, our patient is in this lane. We are getting the list control band, but we are not getting the normal alpha 2 band. So this means that the patient has become homozygous for alpha 3.7 deletion. This was still an alpha plus deletion, which is why the lady is asymptomatic. Her hemoglobin was nearly okay, but her red cell indices gave the game away. Okay. And this, of course, is a normal individual. So... That was case one, a case of uh, alpha thalassemia trait. Keep moving on to case two. Now, this was a 23-year-old male, and he's been complaining of intermittent jaundice for the last 10 years. He's also required occasional transfusions, but very occasional. There's a history of total three packed RBCs in the last 10 years. He's now come to the hospital because his hemoglobin has dropped again. It is 5.3, so there's severe anemia. This anemia is microcytic and hypochromic, 77.9 femtoliters is the MCV and MCH is 18.7 picograms. He also has a low MCHC and this time the RDW is high along with a low hemoglobin. So this is looking like a thalassemia intermedia phenotype. So we did an HPLC and in this HPLC the F is normal. The hemoglobin A2 is reduced, it's 1.8, the reference range is uh, 2.0 to 3.4. And in addition, we have these bands. So this is called the pre-integration region. And here we've got these two, sorry, not bands, but peaks. We've got these twin peaks. And this is very, very typical of an HBH disease. So in this patient with this clinical background, suggesting a thal intermedia type of presentation with microcytic hypochromic anemia, a reduced A2. So the A2 is also reduced. It's just 1.8. And with the presence of these pre-integration peaks, the diagnosis is almost certain to be HBH disease. How will we confirm it? Luckily, a very simple test is, preparation, uh, is available. We can do an HBH preparation. And in that, we expect to see golf ball-like red, cell, red cells because of HBH inclusions. So what happens? If three out of four alpha globin genes are deleted in HBH disease, then we're going to get beta-4 tetramers. And the beta-4 tetramers are going to be precipitating every time they are going to be exposed to a dye-like brilliant cresyl blue, which is mildly oxidizing, uh, which is a mildly oxidizing dye. And you get these beautiful looking golf ball-like RBCs. It's a supravital stain, so some reticulocytes are also showing up, this darker blue filamentous material. You can also confirm it. Yeah, so these are the golf ball-like RBCs. You can also confirm it on hemoglobin electrophoresis where HBH comes as a fast-moving band. So this is the hemoglobin electrophoresis done on cellulose acetate membrane at pH 8.4, so at an alkaline pH. And the way to interpret it is we look for the point of application and we look where hemoglobin A or adult hemoglobin is going to be coming in. So every uh, he, and each lane is here representing an individual patient. So we are uh, so we're going to be seeing in a patient whether we're going to have slow moving bands or fast moving bands. And HBH comes as a fast moving band. So this is the lane where our patient was, and we got a fast moving band corresponding to HBH. The slow moving band differentials are SDG Q India Lepore in a slow moving band, which is slightly closer to adult hemoglobin and CAOA2 which come closer to the point of application. 
hemoglobin F is also a slow moving band but it is much closer to the uh, adult hemoglobin so that clinches it yeah, on hplc uh, hemoglobin uh, h came as two pre integration peaks but there are other causes of pre integration peaks as well they could be bilirubin acetylated hemoglobin f and hemoglobin bars so in this hplc we can see what bilirubin looks like it's a very sharp early pre integration peak sometimes in persons for instance this is now a patient with beta thalassemia major so he has hardly any adult hemoglobin and he has predominantly fetal hemoglobin which is 90.7% you will get these pre integration peaks which are nothing but acetylated hemoglobin f or these are post translationally modified hemoglobin f one should not confuse acetylated hemoglobin f or bilirubin peaks with hbh peaks which were twin peaks and kind of spread out across this pre integration less than 1 minute region on hplc okay so with that we'll move on to case 3 this was a 22 year old male and remember hemoglobinopathies are genetic disorders so it's useful to know the ethnicity of that person so he was a punjabi khatri man he's been complaining of anemia and mild jaundice for the last 4 years or so since he turned 17 so not a very long history but it's obviously now a chronic history he's been symptomatic he's required 6 to 7 pap red cell transfusions in the last 4 years around this time after a recent transfusion a dct or a direct coombs test was done outside which came positive and that led to the patient being diagnosed as autoimmune hemolytic anemia he was started on corticosteroids he didn't really respond but you can have patients who don't respond very quickly so he's been on steroids on and off and hplc was done outside and it was normal somebody did think that could this be a thalassemia intermedia in a young man but it was normal when they examined him his liver was not palpable but the spleen is moderately enlarged it is 7 cm below the costal margin so what are we looking at in this young man this was his hemogram hemoglobin was 8.8 the tlc and platelets were normal rbc count was proportionately reduced according to the hemoglobin and he has microcytosis and hypochromia also uh, His RDW is markedly elevated at 35.1 uh, percent, and the reticulocyte count is also elevated. So just remember that in thalassemia, typically the cause of um, anemia is often predominantly within the bone marrow in the form of ineffective erythropoiesis. So the reticulocyte count typically does not rise. So in this patient, even after correction. for his anemia if the reticulocyte count is almost 12% then we are looking at a hemolytic anemia so this was his blood film over here very striking an isopoikilocytosis microcytosis hypochromia these sort of misshapen rbcs extremely hypochromic cells nrbcs and tear drop cells as well so now the blood film is looking like thalassemia major or intermedia but the reti count is going against it so because of that when he came to us we repeated the hplc so this was the hplc it's an older system this is the biorad variant one we found that his hemoglobin f was normal 0.6 a0 was normal and the a2 was actually mildly reduced again 1.8 so the a2 is 1.8 In addition, now look at this pre-integration region. He's jaundiced, so there's a spiky peak, but there are these two peaks as well. So we are now confused as to could this patient be having HBH disease? Yeah. So these are the two peaks that we saw, but we just now saw another HBH, uh, and this is again another typical case. So this is what a typical HBH peak looks like. They are not that um, uh, easy to miss. On the other hand, this patient has very subtle. pre integration peaks so we are not sure so at this point what would you like to do any low cost test obviously we do an hbh preparation so when we did that this was really interesting we used the brilliant crisal blue dye which is a supra vital dye which we also use for the reticulocyte stain we did find some golf ball like rbcs right and of course there is reticulocytosis so that part is showing up as well so these are all reticulocytes and these are hbh inclusions within the red cells in addition there's something really interesting going on there are some red cells which have these sort of inclusions which are 
located on the periphery of these RBCs. So those of you who've seen it before would know immediately that we are looking at Heinz bodies over here. So lots of findings in this patients, both HBH and Heinz bodies. What is the cause of Heinz bodies? Heinz bodies, of course, re re represent denatured uh, uh, hemoglobin. So we usually get them when there is an acute oxidant-induced hemolytic anemia, especially G6PD deficiency. Or if there is a severe unstable hemoglobin-related hemolytic anemia, especially in patients who have undergone splenectomy because then the spleen stops is not available to remove these Heinz bodies and give rise to bite cells. Okay, so wh what's going on in our patient? We then did a test for unstable hemoglobin and the, the tests for uh, unstable hemoglobin, uh, there are two of them, they're called heat instability test and isopropanolol instability tests. So uh, uh, when you heat uh, a sample to about 60 degrees, 56 to 60 degrees, or you add isopropanolol, unstable hemoglobins tend to precipitate. So uh, this uh, solution, this hemolysate will become turbid and you can't see the black line at the back, uh, whereas a normal control is going to uh, the hemoglobin is still in solution. There's no precipitation. You need to usually run a positive control, which is not shown in this figure. And hemoglobin F and hemoglobin E are typically slightly unstable themselves. So you, if you have a known sample uh, with high F or high E, you can use that. Or you can prepare a sample, you can de degrade normal hemoglobin, uh, make it precipitate by using zinc acetate. So in our patient, we have an unstable hemoglobin, but he also has HBH inclusions. So what do you do next? In hemoglobinopathies, it's easy. You do a parental study. These are his parents. Their hemoglobins were perfectly normal, but both of them had microcytic hypochromic RBC indices, MCV of 68.3 in his mom and 72.7 in his father with a relatively normal RDW, just slightly elevated. HPLC in both were was normal. So we remember we just discussed, look at the RBC count, it's high in both of them. So this is, we are looking at a cause of uh, uh, thalassemic red cell indices, but which is not beta thalassemia trait. So his parents are most likely having alpha thalassemia trait. So for this, we then went ahead and did the uh, multiplex uh, gap PCR in the patient. We've got, we got the list band as well as the alpha 2 band. So the multiplex gap PCR was normal. So what's going on? He doesn't seem to have those eight common alpha thalassemia deletions, but he has HBH. So this, just to remember, was a heterozygous alpha 3.7. This is where the band comes. His parents were also normal. And this was the homozygous. This was the older, uh, this was the uh, previous case that we saw. So in such a case, we need to go in for gene sequencing because we're probably looking at a thalassemic uh, or an unstable hemoglobin, which is a point mutation uh, kind of a problem. So when we did the sequencing, the patient actually had two unstable hemoglobins that he had co-inherited, both in the alpha globin genes. So this was something called hemoglobin salanches, which uh, is relatively uh, frequently found in India. And the other one was uh, again in the uh, alpha globin gene was the hemoglobin zuric albis radin. So uh, hemoglobin salanches is uh, uh, a single nucleotide substitution which results in an unstable alpha globin chain, results in severe anemia with early presentation and the best way to recognize it is by sequencing. Similarly, zuric albis radin is also a highly unstable alpha globin chain variant and this gives rise to persistent mild microcytic hypochromic anemia and erythrocytosis. So a patient who is going to inherit two unstable alpha globin chain variants, they are going to, so often the unstable hemoglobins act in a dominant fashion. So even with two alleles which are going to be affected, they will present with a uh, HB, H disease kind of a presentation. So this case got published and the lessons from this is that even minor pre-integration peaks on HPLC in the correct clinical situation where you have a patient with a peripheral smear that looks like thal intermedia, they require further investigation. And HBH can arise by multiple combinations of genotypes and therefore sometimes it can get missed if you only stop at HPLC or if you only stop at uh, the gap PCR. And HBH disease in India especially is a genetically very diverse group which includes both deletional as well as non-deletional forms of alpha thalassemia and their combinations. Okay, so moving on to case 4. Um, 
or at this time maybe i'll take a little uh, breather and ask dr nadeem if we have any questions so far or maybe i can try checking myself well certainly none that i can s oh yes we have some no we don't So, if there are any uh, questions, and please just feel free to type them into the box. We're we're well on track for finishing on time. So, um, without further ado, I will jump right back into my next case. But again, uh, I'll just repeat that if there's anything that was unclear uh, in the previous cases, because there are many concepts that we're introducing in this particular session. Excuse me. So please feel free to uh, type in your queries in the chat box, or maybe there's something on uh, YouTube because I'm not currently looking at that. Um, okay. So moving on to case four. Now this is a 27 year old lady. She is a gravida three, and she's already got one baby uh, at uh, one child, um, uh, and she's come at 32 weeks of pregnancy, and she's come because she's developed severe anemia. She had her HPLC done earlier, and she is a known case of beta thalassemia trait. And at this presentation, too, an HPLC was repeated, and the beta thalassemia trait was reconfirmed. So, just to remind everyone, beta thalassemia trait on HPLC is going to show us a hemoglobin A2 level, which is more than four percent or equal to four percent, but less than about nine percent. So, if the A2 is coming within that range, and there is no other abnormality on HPLC, then together with the red cell indices, you will diagnose it. She is. Not uh, uh, she's got other findings as well. An ultrasound show, even at in this third trimester is showing her spleen span to be 14 centimeters. So she's got about a two centimeter or three centimeter splenomegaly, and she is also required transfusion during her earlier pregnancy too. Right now she is already being transfused, so there's no point working her up for a you know, hemoglobinopathy uh, uh, this time. We can always defer her workup. In any case, she's at 32 weeks. You're going to transfuse her and wait the pregnancy out. So now six months post transfusion, she has come back. Her baby is now six months old, and her hemoglobin also has now become a little better to 7.9 gram per cent. It's still, of course. Very low, but it uh, it's still low, but it's not as bad as it was during pregnancy. She's got microcytosis and hypochromia, and her RDW is elevated. So again, these indices would uh, could suggest iron deficiency, or they could suggest uh, thalassemia, intermedia, or major. So this is her blood film, and we can see there is a lot of poikilocytosis. There are some extremely small red cells, and you know red cells like these can sometimes get counted as platelets and give you pseudo uh, thrombocytosis, or if the platelet count is low, can give you a falsely normal platelet count as well. Her own platelets are of course all right, and her HPLC was done again, and this is just showing beta thalassemia trait. So what's going on? When we have uh, so, what we first did was reconfirm beta thalassemia trait. Last time I told you that beta thalassemia are usually point mutations, and for point mutations, we use the amplification refractory mutation system or ARMS PCR, and this confirmed a codon 89, which is a frame shift mutation, which is one of the common Indian mutations in our patient in the heterozygous state. So, this is the control band. Uh, and this is the band that we got for the beta mutation. So she's beta thal trait, but her CBC and her uh, blood film are obviously worse than you would expect in a beta thal trait. There's no uniform RBCs over here. So in since such a situation, we'll be wondering why a beta thalassemia trait would develop severe anemia requiring transfusions as well as splenomegaly. The differential diagnoses include alpha globin gene triplications and. Or I mean, it could be another hemolytic anemia, or it could be a completely unrelated cause for her anemia and splenomegaly. But the first thing we need to do is exclude alpha triplications. So, in this particular patient, we did a PCR for alpha triplications. This is the control band, and this is the band that we get where we get an alpha anti-alpha 3.7 triplicated genes. So she was positive, and that explained her worse phenotype for a beta thalassemia trait. So probably it's getting a little confusing. So let us see what are these alpha triplications and what is their pathogenesis. So remember, on our chromosome 16, we had all those pseudo alpha genes. The closest was pseudo psi alpha one, and then we had the alpha two, 
and alpha 1 globin genes okay and this is the arrangement from telomere to centromere 5 prime to 3 prime so what happens is that during meiosis these uh, the contra the, uh, the opposite um, uh, chromosome 16 is going to try and is going to pair up or align itself to the partner uh, chromosome 16 because they now have to undergo exchange of genetic material so let's assume that this is the if this was the paternal chromosome 16 this is the maternal chromosome 16 in a cell that is about to undergo meiosis now the alpha 2 and alpha 1 globin genes are very very similar to each other in their sequence and that's because ultimately the, these genes arose by a gene duplication event of each other so it is very possible that the alpha 1 misaligns with the alpha 2 gene during meiosis 1 and when that happens things are going to go wrong because there going, there is going to be a crossover and the breakpoint usually occurs in between these misaligned genes so when that happens and these two misaligned genes are going to break up you going to get one chromosome 16 which will have this alpha 2 a fusion of alpha 1 and alpha 2 and an alpha 1 so this is what it's going to look like and this is what's going to give rise to a triplicated alpha gene on the other hand you will have another daughter Uh, nucleus which is and finally gamete which is forming which will have just this half and this half of the alpha 2 and alpha 1 respectively so you're going to have a, a one um, gamete which is having the alpha deletion the minus alpha 3.7 and at the same time you're going to have an alpha triplicated uh, triple alpha anti 3.7 Okay, so now it stands to reason that in the general population, the frequency of people who have the alpha deletion is going to be equal to the frequency of people who have the alpha triplication, because now we know the pathogenesis of these abnormal uh, gametes, right? Because meiosis happens in the germ cells. But on the other hand, but while we were talking about alpha thalassemia, we've only now talk, we started talking in this class about alpha triplication, and that's because these people are usually asymptomatic. If you get a little bit of an extra alpha globin gene, you're going to be okay because your beta, as long as they're normal, are not going to be um, uh, imbalanced too much. The problem only happens when a person develops beta thalassemia trait, and then. if one beta is gone and you have and that person has three alphas uh, which means if the other alpha chromosome 16 was normal then this person would have five alpha globin genes then uh, because the other one would have had two then there is going to be an alpha excess and that's what happened in our patient so this is the lesson from this case the beta thalassemia trait can interact with alpha triplications and result in a mild thalassemia intermedia kind of a picture whereas thalassemia traits we would expect to not have symptoms and therefore correlation of clinical and ancillary laboratory findings is very important to decide which genetic test to undertake so this is important there is no end to genetic testing um, you, you name it and you can do that test but the the judicious pathologist is going to look at the clinical data and that's why if there's a clinician listening in on this class then uh, you must provide the clinical background uh, in this case this probably the mild splenomegaly the histotransfusions made all the difference into the further testing as well as look at the uh, the hplc make sure that there is nothing but beta thalassemia trait in this case and then decide that we need to do an alpha triplication or quadruplication testing so moving on to our uh, case 5 this is the second last case now this was a 3 year old girl and she had initially this was her second presentation to pediatrics initially also as a newborn she had been uh, uh, found to, she was born with a unilateral cleft palate and at that point uh, about 3 or 4 months later they were planning a, a, a plastic surgery to repair this defect when she was an infant then the anesthetist when she was about to be put up for uh, surgery found that she had cyanosis and her uh, father and grandmother confirmed that yes the little girl as well as both the father and uh, paternal grandma were a little darker than the rest of the family and it was found that they had cyanosis the father and the grandma were perfectly healthy and they had never been investigated so what happened at that point earlier on was that her surgery was postponed pending her workup and her and an hplc was done but subsequently was child the child was lost to follow up she's now come back 
with at the age of three years because uh, her cleft palate still needs to be repaired. She's now having problems. It's an incomplete cleft palate, so she's going on. But okay. So this is her investigations. Her complete blood count was normal because she is cyanosed, and the uh, uh, there was um, and the anesthetist has probably noted this at the point of pulse uh, oximetry. Uh, her methemoglobin levels were done, and they were also normal. This was the HPLC that had been done at one month of age, and at that point too, she had an abnormal peak somewhere where normally we get hemoglobin Q in there, and. Um, she also had hemoglobin F, which is what you would expect in a uh, one-month-old baby and adult hemoglobin. At three years, her HPLC was repeated. She has predominantly adult hemoglobin, but a variant peak of 13.2%. Her father's HPLC was also done, and it is virtually identical to the girl's. She has the same variant hemoglobin as her dad. Okay. So at this point we did uh, sequencing because her cyanosis needs to be explained. It's holding up her surgery. She was found to have a heterozygous point mutation in the alpha one globin gene at uh, nucleotide three sixty. So um, this is that uh, position mutation. It is heterozygous because there are two peaks over here. This is already a known uh, mutation which has been described as hemoglobin M evate. Uh, hemoglobin Ms are called methemoglobinemic variants and uh, hemoglobin M evate uh, in N evate it's a bit of a misnomer but uh, evate is named after the uh, precinct uh, uh, in Japan where it was first found. So you can confirm hemoglobin M evate uh, suppose the lab doesn't have uh, Sanger sequencing accessible what we did uh, we can simply amplify her alpha 1 globin gene the primers are available for sequencing also you have to first amplify it and then you can use a restriction enzyme it can you can find it using bioinformatics databases which are there online so we found that the RSA1 enzyme cuts at the site of hemoglobin M evate. So a normal person would get only one large band, but in our patient as well as her father, we got two extra bands because uh, so there's something off in this labeling. I think the labels have moved. So, uh, or this is okay, maybe. Uh, so, um, sorry, you get one. Um, so the M evate abolishes the restriction uh, uh, enzyme site and you can diagnose it on RFLP. Uh, or maybe we can just try and work it out. This is the normal and we just, uh, so this is the large band. So clearly MRT must be cutting at more than one site and uh, it's creating a restriction site and therefore we start getting these two extra bands every time somebody is heterozygous for this particular uh, uh, mutation. So uh, this case was also published by Dr. Ganesh, um, who's now at Ames in New Delhi. So just remember that methemoglobinemic alpha globin variants may be clinically inconsequential except for cosmetic deformities. So what we're looking at here is an alpha globin chain variant, uh, which has not resulted in a thalassemia. And the diagnosis will usually require genetic confirmation. And you can also design in-house PCR RFLPs very quickly and conveniently to confirm them. Okay, so moving on to our last case now. This is a 60-year-old gentleman. He was a known case of coronary artery disease. So 60-year-old, yeah. So typically, we, uh, he, we've been talking about young people in the rest of the class. But here we've got an older person in a class on hemoglobinopathies. He's been now reporting uh, of progressive anemia for just the last six months. So he's been okay so far, but for six months he's got anemia and he's required two units of packed red cells. So obviously it's severe anemia. On examination, there's only pallor. There's no jaundice, no lymphadenopathy or hepatosplenomegaly. So we did a CBC. Now on CBC, the hemoglobin is low, the TLC and platelets were normal and the reticulocyte count after correction was normal. But look at his blood film. We have an isopoikilocytosis, microcytosis, hypochromia and... Uh, the poikilocytosis is actually pretty extreme. Look at these really small uh, misshapen RBCs. So probably we'll, if he's not iron deficient, then we're going to be looking at a case of thalassemia intermedia, but he's 60 years old. So there has to be another cause for this. 
In addition, he had these circulating blasts. His uh, blood film had 4% circulating blasts. So the, now it looks like we're looking at a hematological malignancy. There was also a left shift in the form of myelocytes and then there were NRBCs. So if you have immature uh, myeloid precursors as well as erythroid precursors, then the name given to that uh, situation is a leukoerythroblastic picture. In the differential, this patient had 56% neutrophils, 31% lymphocytes, but also myelocytes and metamyelocytes and 4% blasts and 42 NRBCs per 100 WBCs, along with these really strange RBC findings. It was a nice target cell. So a bone marrow was done. He's got circulating blasts. You need to know what's going on in the marrow. This was particulate and hypercellular for a 60-year-old man. And there was erythroid hyperplasia. So the myeloid to erythroid ratio was 1 is to 2.6. And the erythroid cells were 75%. In the marrow, there was no increase in blasts. They were only 2%. So what's going on? Now look at the megakaryocytes. There are two megakaryocytes in this field and both of these are small and hypolobate. So he's got this megakaryopoiesis. And this, this megakaryopoiesis was really striking. Two thirds of his megakaryocytes were dysplastic. Yeah, they're all small hypolobate megakaryocytes. In addition, there was 15% dyserythropoiesis in the form of uh, dyserythropoiesis in the form of nuclear budding, nuclear bridging, and binucleation. So, internuclear bridging. Uh, here's a little nuclear uh, bud that's coming out, and this is like a floret-shaped uh, nucleus. 15%. The significance cutoff is usually more than 10%. In addition, his pearl stain showed 12% ring sideroblasts. Okay, so he's got two lineages. What about the third one? As far as WBCs were concerned, there was 48% dysgranulopoiesis in the form of pseudopelgehue neutrophils with hypogranularity and nuclear hyposegmentation. So here's a pelgeroid neutrophil and even within the bone marrow, we can see neutrophils which are bilobed. And here, of course, are the dysplastic erythroid cells. Yeah, this one. Okay, so now the red cell findings seem to be forgotten. We are probably dealing with a case of myelodysplastic syndrome with multi-lineage. Uh, uh, sorry, remember he had 4% circulating blast. So we are looking at myelodysplastic syndrome with excess blasts. One. So this is a trifine biopsy that showed 100% cellularity. And we confirmed the erythroid and megakaryocytic hyperplasia as well as the dysplastic megakaryocytes. So in a 60-year-old male who is anemic for six months has required two transfusions, the peripheral blood is showing 4% blasts and the bone marrow is showing trilineage dysplasia with 2% blasts. We are obviously looking at an MDS with excess blasts, one, because of the 4% peripheral blood blast. But MDS typically has macrocytic anemia. So why is this patient having red cell microcytosis and hypochromia? We need to have a cause for that. So because of this, an HBH preparation was done. And this supravital staining, this time using new methylene blue, showed 30% RBCs showing golf ball-like HBH inclusions. So we're looking at an HBH disease, but in a 60-year-old with just a six-month history. So these are the golf balls. So an HPLC was done next and this showed pre-integration peaks of HBH and in addition because he was uh, he was from Haryana actually, he also showed a heterozygosity for hemoglobin B Punjab. There was a B window peak. The percentage is reduced. It's just about 20% in him because he had been transfused some time back. Okay, so these were the abnormal peaks. So we're looking at an HPH disease but that one that's getting diagnosed at 60 years of age. And this is deep Punjab. So HBH disease in a 60-year-old man with MDS, we now need to think, is this inherited or acquired? We know that inherited HBH disease typically presents with a thalassemia intermedia phenotype, but in children, adolescent, or young adults. On the other hand, our patient had maintained good health all his life and had never required transfusions before the current illness. His family history was also negative. So we did a gap PCR for the eight common alpha gene deletions. And this was normal. So we can again see the LIS band and the alpha 2 band and no other extraneous bands. And you've already seen that this is alpha 3 point, minus alpha 3.7 heterozygous and this one is homozygous. And this one is another deletion. So 
we then went ahead and did Sanger sequencing. We'd seen a case earlier where HPH disease was happening due to hemoglobin uh, salantius plus uric albicidin, but in this particular patient, sequencing was also normal. So, we, his daughter was also coming with him and we did her cap PCR and sequencing and they were also normal. So, now the suspicion of acquired HBH disease seems really strong because we can't find a deletion, we can't find a thalassemic mutation. So, then targeted NGS was done. This included uh, 54 genes that were involved in hemoglobin regulation and uh, this was done on a MySeq platform uh, in research block B for those of you who are from PGI uh, and this is what we got. So uh, this is the uh, uh, result analysis and we found mutations in a, uh, a mutation in a gene called ATRX which stands for alpha thalassemia and mental retardation on the X chromosome. So this is an example. So this what we found was a, a missense mutation, a single nucleotide A to C transposition that led to a lysine to threonine change in a gene called ATRX. So now what's going on? We don't have a mutation in his alpha globin gene. He seems to have alpha thalassemia along with MDS EB1 and he's got a uh, mutation in a gene which is on chromosome X. Alpha globin genes are on chromosome 16. So, uh, the, this is of course first you need to validate the mutation that you got by Sanger sequencing. This was done. It was there in the patient. It was absent in his daughter. And then you need to check whether this mutation is pathogenic or not. This variant is pathogenic or not. And in silico prediction tools predicted this was probably a pathogenic variant. Uh, and the, that was because it was affecting a splice donor site and this substitution leads to a splicing defect. It was not present uh, previously described in the normal population and this is evolutionarily a very highly conserved position. So again, a mutated uh, variation at this particular position was very likely to be deleterious or giving rise to a disease. So this variant was classified as likely pathogenic based on um, certain guidelines that we use and was most likely the cause of his acquired alpha thalassemia. So uh, this is what the uh, ACMG guideline does uh, based on different pathogenicity prediction criteria uh, depending on basically the criteria that we mentioned here. It's a splice site, it was not found in the uh, genomic databases and it's a highly conserved position. So this is very likely to be pathogenic. So, this patient actually had acquired alpha thalassemia along with a myelodysplastic syndrome because of, a, because of an acquired mutation in his ATRX gene. This is an acquired syndrome characterized by somatic, non-germline point mutations or a splicing defect in the ATRX gene. It happens in myeloid disorders, primarily MDS. So, the ATRX protein is a chromatin remodeling factor and this is responsible for down-regulation of alpha globin gene expression and ATRX predominantly binds, so ATRX is on the X chromosome but its protein is going to uh, uh, act as a transcription factor and bind, uh, sorry, a chromatin remodeling factor and bind several kilobase upstream of the alpha globin genes in a tandem repeat sequence that is uh, denoted psi zeta. So, what happens is that in a patient with MDS, because of genomic instability, if the ATRX binding site gets deleted then or, or uh, mutated, then the um, uh, 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 alpha globin gene is not going to be expressing and um, you're going to get acquired alpha thalassemia. Okay, so uh, most cases of uh, alpha thalassemia with MDS are elderly males and this is extremely rare. The frequency is 0.5% even in MDS. But if you take those MDS who have microcytosis, MDS typically have macrocytosis, then the frequency rises to about half. And this particular case was also published by Dr. Nabjeet Malik, who was then a DM student and is of course now a faculty. You heard him a few days back on bone marrow, talking about bone marrow. So, mutations in ATRX are rare and non-recurrent and they don't really, uh, as far as we know now, carry a prognostic value and there is some interest in development of a targeted therapy. So, with that, we've come to the end of today's uh, class, uh, the part two of quantitative globin gene defects and now for our conclusions. Alpha thalassemia, remember, requires molecular diagnostics for a definitive diagnosis 
and especially uh, of the symptomatic subtypes. However, it can be suspected based on the more conventional laboratory tests like the CBC, peripheral blood film, reticulocyte count and the HPLC. On the HPLC, alpha thalassemia trait and silent carrier can, will uh, have either a low normal or sometimes a very mildly reduced HbA2 and HbH disease will have pre-integration twin peaks. Alpha thalassemia typically plays, plays a role as a phenotype modifier in patients with beta thalassemia trait, sickle cell disease and other hemoglobinopathies because excess of alpha thalassemia, uh, sorry, excess of alpha globin genes um, as uh, will be seen in alpha triplications can worsen a beta thalassemia trait. On the other hand, a co-inherited alpha thalassemia uh, in a patient with uh, beta thalassemia major is going to improve the clinical phenotype. And very rarely, alpha thalassemia may be acquired in a myeloid neoplasm, MDS or MPNs, due to either cis-acting deletions, if the chromosome 16 uh, telomeric part gets deleted, or trans-acting mutations, like we saw in uh, ATRX on the X chromosome. So with that, I'm uh, at the end of my two lecture uh, series, and I'd like to thank uh, Professor Reena Das, our technologist, Sanjeev, Jasbir, Harikishan, and Veera, uh, research staff in the lab, Dr. Manu, Namrata, Rahul and Karuna, uh, Karuna is left now and various funding agencies that uh, have funded various parts of our research. So uh, thank you very much and if uh, and I'll hand you back to the moderator. Thank you so much. Very extensively done, so nicely presented. The case-based teaching was so brilliant. Of course, the detailed part of that Sanger sequencing, I don't understand. But, uh, of course, it was so, so nicely done. Wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> just to uh, tell you that uh, one of the postgraduate students from JIPMAR had written to me saying, we are waiting for the alpha lecture, the globin chain part two. Sir, the first one was so good, we are waiting for that. So now it is there and it is much better than the previous one. Brilliantly done. Thank you, Dr. Prashant Sharma. So wonderfully done. Thank you for the effort which you took. I mean, I could see from the presentation that the amount of effort you took in trying to compile everything, put it up together, come on this platform with such a busy schedule of yours. Still, you know, you teach everything so nicely. Brilliantly done. Thank you so much. Uh, just to before I close, let me request you please share the PDF so that I can share with the students on the Google Drive. And uh, right, thank you so much. Let me just see on the YouTube if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you for the rich praise and uh, to the uh, unnamed uh, Jipner student, please feel free to write in. Uh, both Professor Das and I are always available. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll I'll pass that information also that uh, in case they have any clarification I'll, I'll ask I will first take your permission before handing over there to them your email ID if they would uh, oh, it's, it's always uh, you uh, always have my permission sir to share it with oh, students thank you thank you so much so if there's any queries I will just pass on the email ID and they can directly contact you right I don't see any questions on the YouTube either so Dr. Sharma thank you so much God bless you thank you for coming on this platform Right. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Bye-bye. Thank everybody. you. Bye. Take care.